Lois, other families fight too, right? Not this much. Do you think maybe we should think about getting it? It is what it is. Let's just get Stewie to college and go from there. Uh, Kitty, you know Family Guy just turned 25, right? Oh, crud, I forgot. Oh, crud, I have work to do. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about Family Guy. Or, more specifically, Peter Griffin. PETA. I was saving this for a subscriber special, but eh, I guess I can get it out of the way now. Happy birthday, family guy. You know what number is better than 24? 25. Now, Family Guy is responsible for many of the modern adult sitcom cliches animated-wise, especially the idiot father. And let's be real here, Peter Griffin is an idiot father with a lot of mistakes under his belt, and he's one of the worst. So we are gonna count down the top 25 worst things Peter Griffin has done. Typical Family Guy rules are in effect. They have to have happened in the episode itself, no cutaways, etc. And this might be a tad controversial, but no epic chicken fights. They had no idea where to include them, or if they counted, and I had a theme of 25 to keep in mind. So we're not doing like a honorary 26 spot. Okay, so let's discuss. Here are the top 25 worst things Peter Griffin has ever done. Listen, I, I gotta be honest with you. I am not, in fact, the president of Hot Wheels. Mm-hmm. Well, the small lies don't matter. To be fair, this did not technically happen. They even pointed out in the episode itself. Well, if you think about it, I, I wasn't really cheating because it was with you. Well, you didn't know that. Yeah, but you know what? In some way, I, I think I did. But intent always plays a role for me, especially when I make any kind of list. So I added it. During the episode Call Girl, Peter gets sued for stealing a motorcycle with a sidecar, meaning that Lois needs to get an actual job to support the family, besides piano lessons. They only pay so much. Speaking of earlier, he annoyed everybody with his falcon, Xerxes. What do I do? What do I do? Well, just hope he's not standing on your soft spot. Well, is that possible? Because that could really mess up my... <laughs> I like the name, but really, dude? Lois is approached to do voiceover work, which everybody assumes will be, like, television or movies or stuff like that. Turns out it's an operation for Cream Fresh, Like the one Randy called in that one episode. Right, Lois, you know the drill. And whatever you do, do not mention computers or the internet. They cannot know about it. However, it pays really well, so Lois accepts. As Lois doesn't want anybody to know it's her, she puts on the persona of a woman named Classy. Obviously, nobody would recognize her voice in a town with 15 people. Hello? Uh, hi there. <clears throat> I can tell you're good at this. Doing weird requests all day does tire her out, so she refuses to allow Peter to touch her, and Sock Lois doesn't cut it. No! Sock Lois doesn't feel authentic to me anymore! Peter, wanting comfort, is advised by Quagmire to call the number Lois is working at, and he gets connected to her. How convenient! Oh my god! <clears throat> um... Well, hello, Peter. Peter becomes attracted to Classy, as he's too stupid to realize it's Lois. And eventually, he works up the courage to go to a hotel with her and cheat on his wife. To prove a point, I guess, Lois goes wit, and she wears a wig, and he doesn't recognize her, and they do the deed. Rotten cheater! <gasps> Lois! You, 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 the phone lady, you, 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 the phone, you, you, the phone, you, the phone, you, the phone lady, you, the phone lady, you, the phone lady. Well, we know for a fact he technically didn't do it. Peter had no clue that wasn't Lois, so he was going to willingly cheat on his wife. And we know for a fact that he ended up going through with it over a woman who is paid to pretend to like him. And this is me on the moon. I, I didn't really go there. It, it was just in my imagination, so I drawed it. Wow, you're really talented. Word to the wise, my dear. Never fall for a woman who sells herself. It always ends badly. He even had speeches prepared for each member of the family when he left. Chris, people are going to tell you that you're stupid and that you're no good.
Bye, Otis. But then again, this is Lois. Maybe it was a long time coming. Volcano insurance? That's ridiculous. Oh, that's the same thing you said when you talked me out of getting that cloud insurance. Look at them up there. Just plotting. Saving is a big problem for many families, especially today. I mean, depending on where you live, $100,000 isn't even that much anymore. And the Griffins are no different. However, it is always good to at least have some money saved up in case something happens. Call it your rainy day fun. I myself try to keep at least $1,600 away at any given time, as that's about how much my rent is. And if I don't make that much, that one month, I could at least put that towards the rent, as rent is my highest expense. Peter is helping Chris with his math lesson, and his teacher is Mr. Shackelford. Mr. Shackelford says if I don't learn it, I won't be able to function in the real world. Wait, Shackelford? Like, Rusty Shackelford? At that exact moment, Peter meets a door-to-door -door salesman with a jaw that reminds me of Kane from the amazing Digital Circus. Eh, not convinced. He doesn't have Bubble with him. I won't take him seriously. Not Kane is selling volcano insurance and requests $200 from Peter, even if they live in Rhode Island and the nearest one, I'm guessing, is in Yellowstone. And that won't erupt for at least a million years or more. We're fine. The road won't happen in our lifetime, thank goodness. However, Nod Kane flatters Peter so much that he gives him the money, right when Stewie destroys Meg's glasses. My daughter just so happens to need a new pair of glasses. Lois, no one really needs glasses. You wear glasses. That's only to fool the man from the draft board. They don't have insurance or America's Best. However, the reason it's so low is because it is a small moment, and like most Family Guy Act 1 plots, it's mostly forgotten about after the commercials. This episode is primarily about Peter believing that Jewish people are both good at math and managing money, and him wanting to get Chris to convert to Judaism in order for him to be good in math. Plus, he felt awful when Lois had to call up her mother and beg for some money. Mother P he does an excellent provider. No, mother, I do not think I'd be better off married to a chimp. So there's that. Plus, he and his new friend, Max Weinstein, who's also Jewish, but he's a good Weinstein, were able to successfully badger not Kane to get the money back. So just refund this man's money and we'll be on our way. I don't have your money. How about that money? No way, that's Lois's rainy day fund. Ah, oh, damn it. Happy ending, kind of. Well, you know, I figured the sooner I cast a check, the sooner they uh, catch their mistake. <laughs> Look, why are we making a federal case out of this? OMG, it's Peter's first bad thing. Of course, it's getting a spot on the list somewhere. What, you thought Peter was a saint back then? Remember, a few episodes after this, he killed a bunch of cultists who were all around his daughter's age would punch after they were ready to leave the cult. In the pilot episode, Dev Has a Shadow, Peter gets fired from his job at the toy factory. Oh jeez, for how long? For falling asleep on the assembly line and letting a bunch of violent toys go on the shelves. And not wanting to tell the family, he applies for welfare until he can find another job. Have any disabilities, past injuries, physical anomalies? Uh, oh, oh, I didn't have gas for the first time until I was 30. Now, welfare typically isn't that much, just enough to help you get by, or that's at least what it's meant to do. However, thanks to a computer error, Peter ends up with a fudge load of coin, and rather than tell the government, he keeps the money to himself, which is a crime. Officially on welfare. Uh, how much are we getting? Uh, let's see, $150 a week. Wait, that's a comma, not a decimal. And honestly, as I'm paranoid as all heck, that's a really scary crime. Imagine if, say, you ended up with a higher than normal tax return, and you just assume you got a premium or whatever. Only it turns out that wasn't the case. How are you supposed to know it's fraudulent? That's, like, insane to me. Unlike a lot of other examples, Peter actually ends up facing legal action. And not legal action in the sense of a quick joke. This is, like, a huge dramatic moment. 
Oh, I tell you, Brian, all the rumors about dropping a soap are true. Oh, yeah, you can't hold on to that thing to save your life. Oh, we're slipping all over the place, guys were laughing. Hey, there's a guy who couldn't hold on to the soap. At first, Peter uses the money to give the family all they want and more, such as collagen injections for Meg. Wait, he used to care about Meg. Ah, oh, this is great. I can finally afford to give my little girl the lips she's always dreamed of. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> However, he eventually starts to feel remorse and wants to give the money back during the Super Bowl. Okay, taxpayers, here you go. Looks like we're getting some rain here tonight, John. Fun fact, this episode aired after the 1999 Super Bowl, meaning it's several months older than me. I still have no clue who played that year, or even this weekend as I spent it working, and as I previously established, I don't know how sports work. But this gets Peter and Brian arrested and the former put on trial. In fact, he and later Lois, when she pleads for her husband to get mercy, are nearly sentenced to 24 months in prison. I'm sentencing you to 24 months in prison. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no! Oh no! Oh yeah! Which is actually pretty generous considering how in some states welfare fraud can get you anywhere from 5 years to 7 years to even 10 years. But Stewie's mind control device gets the judge to change his mind, and better yet, get Peter his job back. Gosh, I can't separate a kid that young from his father. It's it's unjudgmently. Oh, hell, you've learned your lesson, right? Yeah. All right, you're off the hook. I wish I had that. The mind control device. I have many ideas. Well, after opening all these gifts, I could use a little wine right now myself. <laughs> glug, 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 glug. <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Getting old is something most people aren't too crazy about. It's something I'm not too crazy about. Not all cats have nine lives, guys. And Lois comes out of her shell, Lois's birthday is coming up, but she isn't enthusiastic. And of course, Peter is husband of the year and sympathetic to his wife's concerns. Keep so busy with your kids, time just seems to slip away and then you turn around one day and you- Okay, bye, stop making noise. <sighs> Wow, great husband, guys. Brian says they should throw Lois a surprise party to show how much they care, and Peter gives her a toast. Well, more like a roast, which spells out that Lois is as worn out as a gym sock in Chris's bedroom, or a broom in Steve's bedroom. You may not be the young filly you were when I met you, but you're still my reliable old plow horse who's there each day to pull the plow, to help around the barn, to Lois! To, to Lois! Lois! What a D word! I have so much to say about this, but no way to articulate it. Brian, can you help me out? Jeez, what the hell's her problem? Peter, she was already feeling insecure about her age, and then you went and gave her that horrible speech. Thank you. This speech causes Lois to enter into a midlife crisis and do all kinds of crazy behavior like trying to sleep with Justin Bieber. And while, yeah, a lot of it is on her, that doesn't mean Peter wasn't without his actions. And that's what's important here. You better watch who you're calling a child, Lois, because if I'm a child, then you know what that makes you? A pedophile. And I'll be damned if I'm gonna stand here and be lectured by a pervert. Yeah, I'm just gonna rip the band-aid off. Peter is a pervert of the worst caliber. He should be in jail. He rhymes with credo turnstile. He's like Jimmy Seville, just without any of the power or influence to lure in victims. In the later seasons, it's a joke that Peter is a pervert several times over, be it him non-jokingly wanting to get physical with Chris in fresh air, or staring at a random kid at the department store. Holy wackazoli. Dad! What? Don't what me, you know what you did. Hey, I may be your husband and your dad, but I'm still a man. But the worst is in he's black. Donna and Lois forbid their husbands from hanging out with each other, even though Peter and Cleveland have known each other way longer than their spouses. The husbands try to find ways to get the wives to reconcile. Reconcile? 
one of those two. Then Peter suggests the idea of an offensive art exhibit. That way, they can go shield up Rothlowski and bond over the experience. Well, women will always band together to stop an offensive art exhibit from coming to town. Yeah, I feel like only Donna would hate it. Lois wouldn't give a crap. While everybody is on board with the idea, they see it includes infants in suggested positions. Oh, no, no, no. There is a special place reserved in hell for people like you. And not people with POCD who are actually struggling. Thank gosh we never see it. And also... And they're time stamped as far back as 1998, which is way before we had this idea. I need help. <laughs> <sighs> Now, I was on the fence about including this. You guys know I have my rule about not including cutaways, as their status of canon is vague. But as it happened several times, it felt weird not including it. And let's not forget that when he becomes a redneck, he outright says he wants to get physical with Meg. What are you doing? Meg, I'm a redneck. Which means I am about to do something to you that you will not remember until you're 40. So yeah, maybe it's a good thing they only joke about this and not explore it. Sir, there's a weight limit on this coaster. The rule is you can't look hilarious on this motor scooter. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's just no way. As somebody who is overweight, I felt this. It's all in the thighs. And then you blow up. During Amish Guy, Peter learns of a new roller coaster that's opening up in Six Flags Columbus. Wait, there's a Six Flags in Columbus? I went to Columbus last December and I did not see one. The only downside is roller coasters have weight and height limits. And as Peter is Peter, there's a huge chance he'll be rejected. So before the trip to Columbus, he tries to slim down, but he fails. Ha <laughs> ha, no you don't. No, no, you can't go in there. The trick is oatmeal. Trust me, the pounds melt right off. Eventually, he tries to cut corners by simply wearing a girdle. And by some miracle, he gets on the ride. Yeah, why don't you go back to your pond, hippo? <laughs> How about me, sir? Am I too fat to ride? No, you don't seem to be. <laughs> It reminds me of when you're on a plane and you are too big for the seat, so you need a seatbelt extender, but it's embarrassing as all heck, so you just put a jacket over your lap when the flight attendant walks by. Because what are they gonna do? Then this happens. Well, this has given me a lot to think about. Being Family Guy, it's quickly forgotten about, so we can get into the episode's main plot of Meg dating an Amish boy. But let's not forget that due to selfishness, Peter caused untold death and destruction. Peter, please lay off the Caltine diet bars. They're not helping. We are going to have to send that family money. I know we are. Well, it would certainly be great if you got a promotion. You'd earn more money, get better health insurance. Lois, I am doing this for the bathroom, and I'm not giving up on my dream. Okay, this is excluding what happens in Hot Shots. That was a cutaway and a plot device. They could have just said the vaccine's expired or something. Now this is a small moment, but one that comes back in a big way. Chekhov's gun. During Tales of a Third Grade Nothing, Peter learns that the higher-ups at Pawtucket get access to an executive bathroom with a ton of special privileges, like privacy or Jurassic Park. Well, this is peaceful. You know what? I would take the first one. So he tries to impress Angela, that way she'll give him a promotion. On top of changing his appearance and trying to be more responsible, Peter also tries to destroy the competition. But in the process, he blows up a children's hospital. Oh my god, this is horrible! Bless their li Oh, okay, okay, yeah! Here we go! All right, everything worked out. On the bright side, at least he did not blow up the children's hospital. How could he? That one's in Brazil. This moment is quickly forgotten about, at least until the end. After Peter successfully passes the third grade, he returns back to work to receive his promotion. And he doesn't get it. Not because he did not finish high school, but because he's going to prison. What, you think everyone just forgot about that? There was an investigation. Nineteen children died, Peter. And the FBI knows it was you. 
Oh no! How will the show go on? Bring back Vinny. This court finds you guilty and sentences you to seven days in prison. You'll be out next Sunday at nine. Oh, I guess he's fine then. Word of advice, don't drop the soap, Peter. It's slippery and it's not like hotels. You only get one. I feel like this is partially my fault. No, Peter, it's perfectly normal to siphon jet fuel from an active runway with the intention of flying a pi- I wonder why at this point Quackmire doesn't just move. In Airport 07, God, I'm old, Peter goes through a bit of a redneck phase, doing all kinds of redneck activities, like putting a couch on his lawn, painting his new truck in pro-life paint. Who cares if it obstructs his driving? He cares about life. Peter, you painted over the back window. Isn't that dangerous? I'm a redneck, Brian. We like people driving behind us to know what our beliefs are. Peter, random joke about rednecks. Okay, guys, look. You have to write your own in the comment section down below because I can't think of any besides how redundant of a name Chicken Fried Chicken is. At one point, Quagmire is late for his job, all thanks to Peter destroying his car. So Peter drives him to the airport, only before he's due to fly a plane meant to go to Atlanta, which is like a two-hour flight, no big whoop, Peter notices them refueling the plane and stupidly believes that if he takes the jet fuel and puts it into his truck, it'll fly. That's all the motivation I need to actually do this. Even if that'll probably not do anything, just saying. I mean, if you put diesel in a car that runs on gasoline, doesn't that like permanently ruin the car? So he siphons the jet that Quagmire needs to fly, and almost predictably, it crashes. It crashes after takeoff. This stunt gets Quagmire fired. All right, who's up there? Oh, hey, Peter. Hey, Lois. Glenn, what are you doing up there? Oh, I kind of moved in, if that's okay. No airline will hire me after the accident. To be fair, I feel like Quagmire partially deserves it. As a pilot, it is his job to be sure the plane is fueled up, and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, come on, you're not gonna go on a road trip without at least checking your gas tank. But on the other end, Peter does hold most of the blame for what happened, and he knows it, so he allows Quagmire to stay with the family. When he ends up being a nuisance, Peter decides that he and the guys will help help Quagmire get his job back. They will hijack a plane. They will drug the flight attendants. And then they will knock out the pilots. And then Quagmire will be a hero and land the plane safely. Only Quagmire doesn't make it in time. And flying a plane isn't like riding a bike. They're all gonna die! Quagmire calls Peter from the ground and tells him how to land the plane, and this gets him his job back. But good thing Peter ends up in prison for committing a federal crime. Guess it didn't take too much for you to get your job back now that you're a hero. Yeah, and I'm so happy for you, I don't even mind that I was raped in a federal prison after I was arrested for hijacking. Well, to answer your question, Connie, apparently I'm married to a man who thinks it's okay to inject an infant with steroids. Wait, Lois, knock it out for a sec. Connie, you are really pretty. Every parent wants their child to defend themselves, especially against bullies. Remember, regardless of gender, the Bobby Hill technique works every single time. Even on girls. Don't believe TV. In a barbecue, Stewie gets into a fight with Joe's daughter, Susie. And Johnson & Johnson doesn't help his pain. We'll put no more tears on the label. But it does make you cry. I know. <laughs> Did anybody else watch this clip during what used to be current events? Or was it just me? Still, as this was post-revival, Stewie doesn't defend himself, despite that whole plotline about the bully who stole his bike. Rather than talk to Joe and Bonnie about Susie's behavior, Peter has an existential crisis about the possible ramifications that a girl beating up a boy could have on society. Exactly how you're worried is gonna happen because of this. World War V. That's the beauty of World War V, Lois. It's so intense, it skips over the other two. Peter, it doesn't work. I have spoken! And he decides the best thing to do is bulk up Stewie. As a baby whose gift lies with his mind, Stewie isn't all that athletically gifted. At least until a local gym bunny offers Peter a shortcut. Oh, your kid just needs a little help. 
I got something that'll get him going. Well, if there's anyone I can trust, it's a stranger at the gym holding a dirty needle. He gives them to Stewie, and Stewie buffs up, then gets more aggressive. The thing is, Stewie doesn't really get stronger or gain the ability to win fights. He just bosses people around. Heck, I don't think he ever got revenge on Susie for beating him up. The muscles are just for show, and as he doesn't keep it up, he ends up looking like a chicken wing after a lifetime of disordered eating. Your steroids have worn off. You're weak like everyone else. And guess what? There's a toll in the hall now. Stay away from me. And now, here's something we think you'll really like. Is there a problem back there? You bet your funny accent there's a problem. I'm stuck up here in the nosebleed. Oh, of course. How could we not have recognized the great nation of Pretoria? I think it's a dream of many of us to run our own country, or at least be a political leader. Not me. Congress is where all the power lies. For most people, it's a near impossibility, but Peter was able to make it a reality, and he did nothing good with the role. One day, Peter learns that people get this thing called tax refunds, and they use them to buy cool things. Last year, I used mine to buy Broadway tickets and pay part of my rent. Peter wants to use his to get a pool, but unfortunately, he doesn't qualify for one. Weirdly enough, just saying, even after he gets audited, he has a low-paying job, three kids, a wife, a talking dog. I'm sure he's got some medical expenses somewhere. There should be something. Still, he wants a pool and goes to Mayor West for a permit, especially after it turns out the zoning laws forbid them. Only, due to a technicality, Peter's home isn't even part of Rhode Island or the U.S. Sorry, but according to this map, you're not even part of these United States. Which would make you... A COMMUNIST! Ah! Ah! Whoa, so it's smaller than even Monaco or the Vatican. Now this would both be cute and newsworthy, but Peter exploits it for all it's worth and creates his own country called Pretoria. He wanted to originally name it Peterland, but copyright is a thing. From this day forth, this territory will be known as Pretoria. I wasn't gonna call it Peterland, but that gay bar down by the airport already took it. The thing is, this is Peter, and he believes that as his own sovereign country, he can't be tried for any crimes he commits on American soil. For example, he steals Joe's pool and turns it into Joe Ohio. What? You can't just come over here and annex my pool. Oh, uh, yeah? Well, according to paragraph 7, sentence 3, word 8 of the Geneva Convention, the... And he thinks can't touch this because MC Hammer can't sue. Except for you. You can touch me. As a result, the U.S. decides to annex Pretoria through Operation Desert Clam, cutting the Griffins off from any major resources and surrounding them with tanks. Look at what we're reduced to. Our own baby has to use newspapers for diapers. No, 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 this, this is fine. The family leaves, but Peter stays, at least until he learns that the U.S. intends to bomb his house back to the Stone Age, so he reluctantly gives up his power. While pretty minor, I guess Peter's behavior warrants a spot. As president, he did nothing good. He did nothing to help anybody. Is it any wonder the only good thing he got out of the situation was Lois offering to scratch his back with a matchbook? I'll scratch your back with a matchbook cover like you like. Oh, Lois. Oh. Would you call me Big Rudy when you do it? Which doesn't seem like a plus, but a punishment. Oh my god, that seems like it would hurt. Ben Stiller, help me! No, Peter. I heard what you said about my movies. How'd you hear? Hello! Go to hell, you mutant offspring of comedy people! Wow, what an ableist jerk. After the fiasco with Peter's footy pajamas, the Griffins earn a bunch of money after they find an antique Rhode Island shipping token in the carpet, and they use the proceeds to open their own restaurant, Big Pete's House of Munch. Unfortunately, they have trouble attracting customers, mostly because they treat the ones they can get super badly, so there's no repeat business, like putting rat vomit on somebody's prime rib just because he can complain there wasn't enough juice. Tell him bon appetit.
or refusing to serve somebody with a Discover card. Look, you don't have to insult me. No, no, no. You are going to sit there and listen to the funny things I would take instead of your credit card. To get more business, Joe says that he could invite his friends over and they'll pack the place. Peter is excited as he assumes Joe's friends will be cops. This is awesome! Bunch of cops in uniform hanging out in my restaurant. This is going to be cooler than that time Ben Stiller taught me how to be myself. Better break out the donuts. Only it turns out Joe meant paraplegics, who Peter doesn't want as he thinks the restaurant won't be cool. I thought you were bringing your cop friends over. What are all these parallelograms doing here? You mean paraplegics. These are my friends, Peter. Come on, guys, let's eat. Which I disagree with. I feel like Peter would be considered an inspiration for being an ally and providing those people with a safe haven. Besides, imagine how much he'll be saving on chairs. So he refuses to allow Joe and his friends to eat there. And he even badmouths Joe to his face. It's a lifestyle choice you're forcing on America. We handicapped are a proud people. Yeah, when you're not drinking and gambling on your reservations, which we gave you. Left with no choice, Joe and his friends form a giant robot called Crippletron. <laughs> what are you gonna do, Joe? I'm up here. And you're down there! And they literally cripple Peter. Peter will never walk again for like two weeks. And during his first day as a paraplegic, he learns how hard it is and apologizes to Joe for how he's been acting. And they are square. The shape of evil! I thought you and your friends were just a bunch of gross cripples. But I've been in a wheelchair for 45 minutes now and I see how tough it is. As this doesn't totally compare to what Joe goes through, and on top of that, Peter kinda deserves it. Joe was only crippled in the line of duty. Peter got crippled because he was an ableist idiot. Peter, you were the only one who was even taking this thing seriously. Jews are gross, Lois. It's the only religion with the word ew in it. Something you need to know about Peter is he's an Irish Catholic, although he's not very observant, unless it relates to the plot. After all, Lois often has to force him to go to church. One time, he even kidnapped the Pope just to make peace with his father, Francis. However, he's occasionally dabbled with other religions. After Lois has a breast cancer scare, they learn that Lois's mother is a Holocaust survivor, but she hid her heritage when she married Carter. Father made me conceal the fact so he could get into country clubs. It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do, dear. And that means that by Jewish law, Lois and the kids are Jewish, right? Isn't that how it works? While Lois doesn't want to connect to her roots, which is okay, Peter is all too happy to get involved. Shalom, Jews! Wow, Dad, where did you get all that glistening chest hair? It came with my Star of David. At least until Francis, who died by the time this episode aired, tells Peter that if he becomes Jewish or upholds any Jewish traditions, he will be forsaking Christianity and he will go to hell and not be able to go to the Dagobah system. If you forsake your religion, you'll spend eternity in hell. Oh god, I don't want that. Then you better knock off all the Jewish stuff. Clearly, Peter forgot how Francis was such a radical piece of that he thought the Pope was too soft just for saying that Peter was a good son. Or that Lois, a Protestant, which is still Christian, just not Catholic, will end up in purgatory with all of the unbaptized babies. Eh, at least Lois likes kids. Therefore, Peter starts to spite Lois, who actually begins to accept Judaism after a talk with her mother. For example, he nails her to a cross made out of Stewie's bed frames. How do you like it? Peter, what in God's name is this? Wait a minute, are, are these pieces of Stewie's crib? I hate it here. Or he shoots at her when she goes to check the mail, like she's Gianni Versace. Are you out of your mind? Relax, Lois, I was aiming for the mailbox, I'm just trying to make a point. Or interrupting her Passover Seder by dressing up like the Easter Bunny. Peter only changes his tune when Jesus Christ appears and says, Guys, he's a Jew too. After all, Christianity is derived from Judaism, and the best thing you can do is be tolerant of other religions. But don't make your own church dedicated to the fonts. Make one dedicated to that one episode of Law and Order SVU that Henry Winkler starred in. Oh my god, I love him in that one episode. Uh. 
Oh, oh God, Brian, don't! Oh, you, you, you! In 1991, The Simpsons aired their beloved episode, Lisa's Pony, where Homer tries to show Lisa how much he loves her by buying her a pony. Only the pony is too expensive, and Lisa has to make the tough choice to sell it. It seems like Family Guy saw this episode and thought, yeah, we could do better. In Family Gay, Lois gives Peter money to go to the grocery store, like less than 20 bucks, and he comes back with a horse he names Till Death. Why? You named your horse Till Death? You know why? Because I'm going to take this horse and shove it down America's throat. Yeah, I'm just calling it the horse. Makes it easier. The horse came dirt cheap, as said horse is really not allowed to say that word. He's Peter, but in horse form. Peter, there's something off about that horse. You have an eye for animals, Lois. This horse is brain damaged. That's why I got it so cheap. Only the horse annoys the family, and being really not allowed to use that word, he needs to be watched 24-7, 365. And because this is a leap year, 366. To make extra money, Peter decides to breed the horse and puts all of his delicious horse milk in the fridge, where his family would be able to eat it, without labeling what's horse milk and what's normal milk. I wonder what the milk tasted like. Was it super salty? In essence, Peter ends up wasting over $100,000 sinking money into a horse, which does nothing but cause chaos and harm several deaf children. Deaf children. Oh. I know you can't hear any screams, but I assure you they are signing frantically just as fast as their little fingers can shape the complicated phonemes necessary to convey dread and terror. I just finger spilled horror, guys. I don't know the actual sign for horror. I need to learn. Fed up with this, Peter sends the horse to the glue factory in the sky, rather than a real one. And then to Mort's pharmacy. Oh boy, I miss the old days when it was just a flaming bag of poop and a hurtful note. Apparently, they don't do that in the U.S. anymore. You know, as much as Peter abused the horse, at least he did not do the horse chores. Wait, but then how do you get all the horse milk? Oh god. He's hurt bad. Someone call 911! He's bleeding too much! He needs attention now! Somebody help! No, she's nagging everyone. Peter had my dream job and he squandered it. Squandered it. Note to self, watch out for Kitty. During You Can Do That on television, Peter, Lois makes Peter actually do his job as a father and watch Stewie. Not babysit him, parent him. There is a difference because he is Stewie's parent and parents are a team. Fathers don't babysit their children. The pair spend the time watching the American version of Jolly Farm and Peter enjoys the show until it's announced that it's going to be canceled or at the very least put on hiatus. And this devastates Peter. Wanting to fill the void, Peter ends up creating his own public access children's show, kind of like Krusty the Clown, called Petey's Playhouse. It's crass and rude, but the show finds its niche through a very special puppet, Saggy Naggy. Peter! Oh, hi, Saggy Naggy. Never mind with hi. It sounds like someone's having fun over here. Oh, how I wish I could do this with my YouTube channel. I mean, it's not like I make rant videos against awful parents rather than go to therapy. I got a life, guys. Saggy Naggy is a cartoonish amalgamation of Lois and all of her insane rantings at Peter. But despite this, it wins over the kids. Hey, Saggy Naggy, I know what'll cheer you up. Do you like pie? I guess. Well, how does this taste? Yay! At the store, Lois sees a rerun of Peter's show and gets assaulted by a bunch of children who think it's funny. <laughs> For some 
reason, none of the adults, their parents, or the employees think to stop them. A group of kids attacked me at cost money. Well, writers take from their lives. You married a creative type. You knew this was a risk. What's that supposed to mean? Now, part of me doesn't mind that Peter created Saggy Naggy. Like he points out, much of the best writing comes from your own life. I mean, my own username, Kitty Monk, was derived from a mean nickname I got because of how I tend to dress when I'm not in cosplay. And it's worked out well for me. But at the same time, as a writer myself, it is a bit of a balancing act to remember that, that people can forget that writing is fiction. And that your writing can have consequences. Peter could have given Saggy Naggy, say, Lois's personality and her voice, but made her look nothing like her. That way, it would be harder for people to connect the dots. On top of that, many of Lois's criticisms were correct. He wasn't doing his portion, and after the show took off, he spent even less time at home. This is the fourth night in a row you've skipped out on us to work on your show. Once again, I'm going to be stuck cleaning up the kitchen, helping out with homework, and bathing Stewie. You know, I'd lay off the nagging if I was you. Reluctantly, Peter gives up Saggy Naggy and moves on to a new gimmick, live animals. Maybe we should poke him with the is the puma ready stick. Oh my god, I can't let him do this! Yeah, he's dead. Or he would be. Thank the giant reptilian bird in charge of everything for subplots. Meg spent the whole episode interning for Dr. Hartman, so she learned how to fix Peter until help arrived. Only, not only is he a horrible husband, he's a horrible father. Did I hold on to the ball? Hang in there, Dad. I'm gonna get you fixed up. Isn't anybody gonna thank me? Yeah, I'll have a water if you're getting one. Meg, if you do end up getting him that water, be sure it's toilet water. He deserves it. I'm actually very hungry. Nobody's gonna want you if you're fat. You wanna eat? Get up to that bar and earn your keep. You know I hit you and you out because I love you, right? I think this is the most modern example on the list. As you can guess from my comments during my putters video, I am in favor of fair work. So long as it's fair and consensual and you're choosing to do it, not forced. Too bad Peter ruins it for me to the point where I can kind of understand why Nevada is the only state where it's legal. An American gigolo, I guess, I'm just gonna call it American giggity. Quagmire's fellow pilot go on strike, and as a pilot himself, he has to follow. Unfortunately, striking means working without pay. So to make extra money, he starts to use his many assets and sell himself. First off, he becomes a stripper, which, okay. Stripping is a very respectable profession. If it weren't respectable, why would real estate agents go to strip clubs for lunch? Then he gets offered the chance to sleep at one of his clients, who will pay him for the experience. So I figured, you know, <laughs> who else but Quagmire? Hey. Awesome cameo. Only by becoming a fan teen, he nearly gets stiffed and Peter has to bail him out. Huh, that's a pun. Hey, you didn't pay my friend, so I'm gonna play with your doorbell until you pay up. Stop it! Which leads to Peter becoming a pimp. And as this is Peter, we all know he's not gonna be like Butters. He's going to be a horrible dude who dresses like this. What the hell did you say to me? Peter, what are you doing? You tripping boy? You're going out if I tell you you're going out. To go off topic for a second, why do pimps dress like this? Like I can get if they're going to a party like the player's ball and you want to show yourself off, but it's still illegal what they're doing and don't you want to avoid detection from the police? So if you want to be secretive, why do you dress like the cosplay closet grew up on you? That always made no sense to me. But anyway, what does Peter do as Quagmire's boss? Well, he forces Quagmire to work around the clock, especially doing a job that simply isn't lying on a bed and staring at the window for 15 minutes. And when Quagmire just wants a break, Peter refuses, harshly. <gasps> okay, let's go. Don't they know they're making love to one already dead? And worse yet, the customers he finds Quagmire are all gross and ooky, and into equally gross ooky stuff. Especially the German stuff. Remember, like what Leanne did? She wants to do German things! 
German things! What? No! He hasn't eaten anything in days! It's not gonna work! Nine! Nine! Of course, Peter and Quagmire make up, but was it really worth all this? I think another negative is that Quagmire did not have to do any of this. Maybe the stripping, which she had no problem with, but not the selling his body for money part. As it turns out, the strike ended a long time ago. Oh, the strike ended a month ago. What? Why didn't you tell me? I did. Are you still GlennQ10 at AOL.com? No. Ah, well, there you go. You know what? Stick that pimp cane down his throat. Give him karma. Come on, Brian. I need this rope in case I open a nautical-themed restaurant. Come on down to Pete's Crab Shack. We got boat parts on the wall, so you know the crab comes from the ocean. As somebody who has never owned a dog, I don't know the struggle, but I know they can sometimes eat weird things or do things to ruin their teeth. But come on, don't count yourself lucky. My cat, Cheese, used to eat plastic grocery bags, jump in the shower when we were using it, and lick tables after we bleached them. While Family Guy doesn't always lean into it, they sometimes make jokes about Brian being, you know, a dog. One day, Peter finds an old toy rope, which used to belong to Brian. And that, as you can guess, means a lot to him. Ew, what would you want that for? It's gross. No, it's not. It's awesome. I can suck on it for the flavor. I can thrash it around, pretend it's a snake. Sometimes I just bite it like this. Brian wants it back, but Peter says finders keepers. Oh, I hated that episode. And it turns into a bit of an obsession. Almost like that monkey dude from the Planet of the Apes reboot movies. Also wants ice cream. No, Peter, it's too close to dinner time. Get ice cream anyway. Oh, what, you thought I was gonna say, Lord of the Rings? You know Andy Serkis was in other stuff. The less we say about Star Wars, the better. Eventually, Peter gets Brian's goat by tying the rope to his car and driving around until Brian lets go, which doesn't happen. And by the end, Brian looks like a used condom. Oh, oh man, I'm real sorry about your mouth, Brian. Damn it, Peter, what were you thinking? This has to be the stupidest thing you've ever done! If you could not guess by my sheer number of Brian videos, I'm not his biggest fan. But that doesn't mean I automatically hate him or thinks he deserves to suffer on that virtue. He did nothing here. Really, Peter? You had to do all of this just because of a toy? You couldn't just buy a new one or give it back to Brian? A headline regarding mass awareness of a certain avian variety. What are you talking about? Oh, have you not heard? It was my understanding that everyone had heard. Heard what? I remember when I was like nine and the episode came out and there were so many memes, especially one of Big Bird from Sesame Street singing Surfin' Bird. I wonder if that's still on YouTube. Well, it is, but it's labeled for kids. Peter and the family are at one of those retro diners. OMG, are they still around? In Jersey, we only have normal diners. And suddenly, a song pops on the jukebox. Surfin' Bird by the Trashman, Peter's favorite song. Darn it, I can't play it. Of course, Peter loves the song, but he starts to quickly obsess over it. The restaurant wants to throw away the record, as Surfin' Bird is from the 60s, not the 50s, and they somehow care about authenticity. They let him have it on the condition that the waiter, manager, whatever, can do Meg. Let's see what your daughter looks like. Okay, I'll do her. But can you tell her to cry and beg me to stop? I think that can be arranged. <sighs> All I'm gonna say is, I hope it was worth it, Peter. At home, Peter annoys the family nonstop with his singing, inserting the song into everything he does. He keeps Lois awake, he bothers Brian and Stewie when they try to eat breakfast, and at one point, he even takes out $6,000 just to buy a commercial to educate people on why they should be listening to Surf and Bird. According to Gallup polls, one in 12 Americans is unaware that the bird is the word. I, for one, dream of an America where everybody knows that the bird is the word. I think the worst thing is how he doesn't just take the record to bed with him like a teddy bear. Which I would say is weird, but I'm 24 and I still sleep with a stuffed animal. He sleeps with it, both literally and figuratively. I took it to bed, had <laughs> with it, it fell asleep in my arms, and this morning it's gone! 
Oh, I wonder if Lois would agree to an Eiffel Tower with the Surf and Bird record. The chaos only stops when Brian and Stewie destroy the record and then go around town destroying every copy they can find. Do you have Surf and Bird by the Trash Man? No, I'm sorry. A dog and a baby came in and bought all 63 copies. Damn it, this is a third used record store with that same story. And while the focus shifts over to Peter finding out about the second coming of Jesus, that doesn't mean this doesn't completely go away. At the end of the episode, to repay Peter for all the fun they had, Jesus gives Peter a copy of Surf and Bird, so Peter can annoy everybody else until the next coming. Although he did give me something right before he disappeared. What? Something very special, Lois. What is it, Dad? What, you haven't heard? Crap! Yay, Peter won. I am so happy. Kitty, no Craig references? Okay. Did you hurt your arm after I shot you in the arm? The shooting was the injury, Peter. Look, I already said I was sorry like a hundred times. Oh, and before I forget, I want my Huey Lewis CD back. One of the most disliked episodes of Family Guy is Brian's a bad father. Because of how Brian treats his son like a meal ticket. But people forget that Peter himself is a jerk in that episode. And he gets everything he deserves and more. Peter and the guys go out hunting. And Peter shoots Quackmire for essentially no reason. Just because. No, I just want to make sure your safety's on. There, see Quagmire? Safety's on. Now this is a gun without a safety. Quite the difference, huh? Seriously, there really is no reason. It's not like he thought Quagmire was a deer, or he slipped and tripped, or he was wiping his gun and forgot to turn the safety off. He just shoots him. What a jerk. Quagmire justifiably cuts him off as a friend, and Joe chooses Quagmire over Peter. Damn it, Peter, that's it! I am done! I'm done with you! I'm done with all your crap! I never want to speak to you again! This friendship is over! I'm sorry, Peter. It's just that Quagmire's been there for me in some pretty dark days. I think you know you're an awful person when your friend accepts a literal rapist over you. Heck, in his effort to get back into their good graces, he assaults Susie Swanson. And rather than cuffing Peter then and there, in accordance with Megan's law, he just tells him to scram. Peter... That's not where you do a raspberry. I closed my eyes too early. I think it's best if you leave. Eventually, Peter apologizes, and Quagmire pays him back in kind for his charity. Nothing got settled. You shot him. I'm the one who has to shoot him. Wait, wait a second. All right, then I get to shoot Joe. All right, he shot me. I mean, if we're doing things fair here, then... Oh no, it's not like Peter has RuPaul's Drag Race level of immunity and a friendship with both Jesus and literal death, which would ensure his immortality, unlike Horace. You're gonna take me to the zoo and roll me around. You know, we're all friends again. Oh my god, what the hell are you wearing? It's a solid gold tuxedo, Lois. I had to fight three rappers down at the nonsense store for this. Wanting to win the lottery is a dream of many people, except me. Half of it goes to taxes, and in many states you need to show up to claim your prize. And I know a lot of people who would take advantage of me if they found out I won. When it comes to money, Peter is no exception. Although he has no clue that the IRS sops up the lottery winnings like bounty on a soda spill, during lottery fever, Peter says the family should enter the lottery, and to do so, he ends up buying hundreds of tickets, even taking out a second mortgage on the house in order to afford them. These are the real lottery tickets. So, in addition to buying 200,000 lottery tickets, you had 400,000 fake ones printed up? I had to be sure. By some stroke of luck, they win, and Peter quits his job. Uh, I would be remiss, however, if I did not extend my gratitude to you for your unwavering fairness and belief in me, and there is a giant poo on your desk. Now, let's remember this is Peter, and his new wealth changes him for the worst. I mean, he gets a butler to buttle his mouth <coughs> and a bloody blood diamond for Lois that's as bloody as an Ultra Sports Tampax tampon. And there's something to be said about how he treats his friends, now that he's come into money. While at first he's comfortable simply giving them money for things here and there, like an investment for enlargement pills for Quagmire. Well, uh, gee, I, I, I don't, uh... Peter, I've taken the liberty of mocking up some sales projections. Wow, that's pretty good. 
And this would be our net profits. He decides that as he is now the highest earner, they will do whatever he wants. Ironically, this is like the one episode to point out that Peter's probably the poorest dude on the block. Joe is a cop and that pays well. And I'd imagine that being a paraplegic, he likely gets some form of disability. And Quagmire is a pilot. Peter, he worked at a toy factory and then he worked as a fisherman and now he works at a beer company. Peter starts to make decisions for his friends and all of them are abusive, like forcing Joe to watch True Blood and find any naked scenes, then getting angry when he includes Anna Paquin, or forcing Quagmire to bite down into ice cream. Now smear what's left of it on your face and look at me with your mouth open. Ugh. I don't even want this now. Ouch, I have experienced that several times myself. Just not with fudgicles because I hate chocolate. The trick is to lick the roof of your mouth. And then he forces the guys to sing Making Whoopi while he shoots at them with a BB gun. For like no other reason than sick enjoyment, he shoots Joe in the eye. And the pair get fed up and leave. Joe got to be so injured that he required a glass eye. This guy! Ah! I'm here to audition for Fiddler on the Roof. Come right in. Oh my god, is he gonna do the bottle dance? Peter, don't. Eventually, Peter burns through all of his money within less than a month. And then they win the lottery again. What do we do now? Well, seems like our only hope is the lottery. Holy <laughs> We won twice and we're right back here again. He even ends up losing the house. The only reason he's back up on his feet is he apologizes to his friends. And Quagmire gives him the proceeds of the investment they made so he can get the house back. And if it makes you feel better, it was money well spent. Just ask Sandra, the waitress over there. We had a great time last night. Tough girl. Made it into work. While this episode has Peter be awful, it's always made me wonder. Is this how Peter is going to act when Carter finally bites it? I mean, Lois grew up with a lot of money, so winning the lottery did not really change her. But Peter, it's only a matter of time. Can I try some Red Bull? Oh my god, can you try some Red Bull? Chris, I take it as an insult if you didn't. Here you go, have some cans. One, two, three, four, five, go on, take up, 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 take question, why does it take like hours and hours? You would think by now we would be able to streamline the process. Then again, we haven't found the cure for rabies or the hantavirus. Peter hates the dialysis, so he blows it off to watch TV at the bar, as he clearly can't just bring an iPad or his phone to the doctor. Missing his appointment makes him look like Bunsen Honeydew. What are you talking about? I feel great. Like I could go another 20 years or more. 
Now Peter is really on death's door, and there aren't a lot of options. Lois isn't a match, they can't find any local matches, and she doesn't want the kids to put themselves out there. However, they do find somebody. Brian. Only there is a small hitch. Dog kidneys are much smaller than human kidneys, and kidneys aren't like an appendix. You kind of need them to live. Meaning that if Brian donates, he'll have to donate both of his kidneys, and the procedure will kill him. As a dog, Brian's kidneys are smaller and don't have the capacity of a human kidney. For the procedure to work, we would need to transplant two. The procedure would kill you. Yes, you heard that right. Just because Peter couldn't do what the doctor said, or drink a coke, he was going to get his best friend killed. What a true friend. Plus, there's so many other variables. What if Peter's body rejects Brian's kidneys? Match or no, Brian is still a dog. I mean, I can get, like, pig valves or pig hearts. They are kind of similar to humans, but dogs? Brian will have died for nothing. On top of that, you and I both know for a fact that Peter is going to screw up his endocrine system once again through another harebrained scheme. Meaning that, yeah, any way you splice it, Brian is going to sacrifice himself for nothing. Eventually, the surgery comes and Peter finds out Brian can live? Dr. Hartman had his doubts about a dog donating kidneys simply due to the logistics. Duh! So he tested himself and they are a match. Well, chances are Peter never would have survived the surgery. I mean, I mean, dog kidneys? I mean, I'm not even sure dogs have kidneys. <laughs> what? Do dogs have kidneys? Yes. Yay! Nobody has to die! Peter, if you take this kidney, I want you to promise me you won't drink any more Red Bull. And don't play any game of drink the Red Bull. Drink the beer is fine, but not drink the Red Bull. Then yes, I will marry you, Dad. Oh, that's wonderful news! You should know this ring is very special. It used to belong to your mother. Okay, I already made a video on Chris and Peter and how I thought Chris was a bit of a tragic character who tries too hard to emulate his horrible father. And this comes back to bite him in a big way in fresh air. Lately, Peter has been neglecting Chris when all he wants to do is spend time with his father. You busy? I was thinking we could spend some time together. Okay, are you a television set or the internet? No. Oh, then no. No, thank you. Jerk. Carter ends up bedridden and Lois doesn't want to visit him, so she forces Chris to go in her place. Chris is bored, but he and his grandfather end up having a fun time. And by morning, Carter decides to change his will to make Chris the sole heir to his fortune. But Grandpa, I don't even want the money. See? This is exactly why you should get it! So refreshing! Which, as I've already described, makes sense when you really start to think about it. Babs wants to retire, so like, even if he insists, yeah, your mom's gonna be dead, I can imagine him giving her enough money to live off of, and then she goes to, like, Florida. Patrick is crazy, Lois doesn't like her family's money, as established in Peter Peter Caviar Eater, I wouldn't be surprised if her sister was the same. Plus, Lois is married to Peter, and Peter ran the company into the ground when he took over for Carter for like two weeks. Peter now wants to pay attention to Chris even if Chris makes a point that he doesn't want the money or the privileges. He attempts to brown nose Chris but when Chris won't budge he cuts to the chase and proposes. It's time to settle down and simplify things like maybe having one ATM card and one bank account. Say yours. Oh. I get it. Even divorcing Lois so he can get the money. What is this? It's a petition to force that hot mom to wear something appropriate at PTA meetings. Oh, thank God. And he takes Chris on a road trip to Vermont. That way, the pair can elope. Okay, I shouldn't have to say how wrong this is, or how Peter's multiple incest jokes imply they won't be having a strictly business green card thing. At the wedding, Lois tries to stop it, but Chris wants to go through with it. Dad and I spent more time together planning this wedding than we ever have before. And if being married means I get to spend even more time with my dad? then it's worth it. Oh, Chris, oh, sweetie, no. This causes Peter to have a realization and decide that maybe marrying his son for money isn't the best course of action. And I guess I learned it's wrong to take your son to Vermont under false pretenses to try to marry him for his inheritance. You, 
you should have known that. Still, I kind of wonder what his end game was gonna be. Was he gonna kill Carter to speed up the process, try to reenact a gentleman's guide to love and murder, and kill the competition, divorce or kill Chris so he gets the money? Is it even legal for a man to marry his son? It is in Vermont. As long as it's a man and a man, anything goes up there. They're a bunch of liberal degenerates. Look, no offense, dude, but Rhode Island is not a community property state. But it is a common law state. Meaning that this road trip, and therefore like half of this episode, wasn't even necessary. I'm an adorable tramp who wears found clothing and eats out of your garbage can. A clown? Dad, I'm 17! It's a known fact that Peter isn't Meg's biggest fan, despite, you know, being her father. And he can be quite abusive towards her. But many of these moments were too small to warrant a spot on the list. Or she stood up for herself and that sort of earned her cool points. That negated how harsh her treatment was. Originally, this section was meant to be about how he drowned Meg by proxy during a flash flood, as he forced her to get him a beer and a sandwich. But I've already talked about that episode a couple of times before, and he did own up to it in a really good way. I think Peter's two dads has him do plenty of damage, and he gets like zero karma for it. Meg's birthday is coming up, and she wants to have a big party at the house. Only there's an issue. Peter and Lois forgot how old she is. You're asking me? Yeah, how old is Meg? I don't know. Well, my god, Lois, I thought you were the one keeping track of it. No, no, I have no idea. Oh, come on, how could you forget? That was the day your dreams were shattered. You don't keep track of that stuff? So they try to get Meg to tell them how old she's turning, while trying to avoid the fact that they forgot. Uh, Meg, uh, I got 16 candles for your birthday cake. How does that sound? That's not right. So, let's... Meg is turning 17, and she's beyond angry that her parents forgot. So she gives them a furrow tongue lashing. You don't even know how old I am! Meg, that kind of language is not appropriate for a girl your age. Or is it? I'm gonna be 17, you jerks! Now, one reason I included this was because compared to Peter's daughter, this feels a little more realistic. And a little sadder. You could see something like this happening in real life versus what we saw during the flood. The party itself is super half-assed and would better be used for a five-year-old. And when May complains, they just call her ungrateful. Mom, this party sucks! I mean, balloons? Pin the tail on the donkey? I'm not five years old. Meg, your father worked very hard to put this party together. The other reason this episode made the list, well, Peter invited his father, Francis. The same father who cursed out Megan for simply holding hands with a boy. This is for Megan. Oh, what is it? It's a cookie from lunch period at the home. Well, I'm sure she'll love this. I want to see her eat it. Peter decides to surprise Meg by dressing up like a drunk clown, which gets his father killed. All right, this is gonna blow you guys away. Ah, 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 ah. Uh, Lois, maybe you better call two ambulances. Yeah. Of course, we know from this episode that Francis isn't really Peter's father, as this episode has him go to Ireland and meet the real guy. But still worth pointing out, at least in Peter's daughter, nobody died. I'm coming, I was just getting Stewie. All right, got the little guy up from his nap. Say hello to everyone, Stewie. Aww. <laughs> um, ouch. I can't believe how much he abuses this one kid. And I thought he hated Meg. Normally, Peter isn't a very good father, despite being a literal family guy. But when it comes to Stewie, he normally wants what's best for him, in his own way. Except here, Chris steals Meg's diary and they start to roughhouse when suddenly they accidentally knock Stewie down the stairs and crack his skull open. Then he doesn't wake up. Is he breathing? It, it looks like it. That's a good sign, right? <laughs> Oh 
my god, that's so scary. They could bring him to the hospital and be sure he's not dead, but they don't want to face responsibility. Even if, imagine if Stewie actually dies, how much worse action they will be facing. So they hide him and essentially play Weekend at Bernie's. Peter catches on as he's done something similar in the past. So, question, how long has Stewie been unconscious? And I wanted to take him to the hospital, but Chris wouldn't let me. Good, Chris. I've taught you well. Okay, that's already bad, but what makes it worse is he hasn't done it, like, once or twice, but multiple times. He's so desensitized, it's like he's gotten it down to a science. When you were babies, I used to knock you kids out every month or so. Sometimes by accident, sometimes when the Patriots lost. You just gotta cover it up, and eventually it all works out. Meg, this is a list of hats. So he gives them tips on how to avoid detection and assures them that Stewie will eventually wake up. Sometime later, Stewie's injury gets worse and kind of infected. Seriously, just take him to a doctor. Say that like he was playing or he snuck out. This is Quahog, CPS won't get called. So he does this. Now, I thought about ending the section here, but I have to remind you guys that Lois sucks. Let's put a hat on him to cover the wound, and, and then let's get some makeup and draw eyeballs on his eyelids. I love you so much right now. Let's go to the hospital. Thankfully, Peter takes Dewey to the hospital, or I guess he ends up in a coma considering this comment. Hey, I just found out it's November. What the f*** happened? Well... You having your period? What? I'm just trying to take an interest in your interests. My period's not an interest. It's something that happens to me that I cannot control. Gross. Why does everybody forget this happened? Take away the comedy, it's one of the worst things he's ever said. During April and Quahog, the family learns that a black hole is coming for the planet and will soon swallow it whole. And as this was before cell phones were a thing, they believe the news and don't do any follow-up research. Neptune and Pluto have already been consumed and scientists estimate that the event horizon will reach Earth by tomorrow. Which means that all life on Earth will be destroyed within 24 hours. At least they aren't in Jersey. There was that one time Orson Welles said we had aliens when we didn't, even if they filmed War of the Worlds like right around the corner from my house. Everybody tries to cross stuff off of their bucket list, Peter especially, but he spends no time with his family. On the day the world is supposedly about to end, Lois calls out Peter for his behavior, where he says, Don't you love me? Of course I love you, Lois. You're the most important person in the world to me. I just hate being around the kids. What? Sorry, I just thought I'd be honest since we're gonna die. What? Dude, those are your children, your babies. And you just, like, consider them a nuisance? What the hell? And it's not even him saying the words out of context. He really means it. Only it turns out this was an April Fool's prank. And now Peter has to live with the consequences of what he said. Yeah, Dad, what did you mean? Don't you like us? Yeah, what well, well, oh, come on, I, I didn't mean that. I was just joking around. Hey, give me a big hug. In Act 3, the kids are all justifiably angry that their father outright said he doesn't like them. And they act accordingly. Hey, what's on tap for school today, kids? Shut up, Dad. Whatever. Come on, guys. Let's go eat in the living room. It stinks in here. You go, guys, meaning he must earn back their love. Nothing works. Not sharing drugs, not playing with toys, not talking about periods. He broke their trust, and he's going to have to spend the rest of his life living with the guilt of what he said, until he decides on an Xbox. Who wants a brand new Xbox? Yay! Oh, Daddy! Oh, my God, you're the best father ever! Yeah! Oh, yay! Yay! Oh, oh, my God! Daddy. Note to sell. When I have children, and they are angry at me, buy them an Xbox. Mom, why did you forget to make me lunch? Xbox. Mom, why did you forget to go to my play? Xbox. Mom, who is my real daddy? An Xbox. I kind of get the helmet, but what's with the water wings? Well, you did order the soap. Oh, like something could happen. You... <laughs> ah, 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 get me out! Get me out! Get me out! Ah, 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 get me out! 
To be fair, to some degree, this is a headcanon that I use to explain why the show went down under. Bear with me, it just makes sense. During Petarded, Peter wins a trivial pursuit. No, he's not smart. He doesn't realize that Lois just switched out the cards with the preschool edition in order to make him feel better. Say the word, what? Ah. Uh, wow. Okay. Um... This uh, really separates the men from the boys. This causes Peter to act shallow and pedantic. What is this, are you going to talk down to everyone just because you won a game of Trivial Pursuit? Perhaps. Until Brian tries to call his bluff by telling him to take the MacArthur Genius Grant test. If he passes, he will officially be a genius and get a fudge load of money. Of course, Peter fails and he gets diagnosed as being mentally really can't say that word anymore. Kitty, I think it's fine in this instance because you mean it in the medical terms. You know, I know, Catherine, it's just I have a running gag to uphold. Peter doesn't like his diagnosis diagnosis and all of the negatives that come with it. Oh my god, what are they doing? Why, why, why are they trying to publicly humiliate me like this? I mean, what, what's the purpose? Oh, shiny red ball. <gasps> Peter, watch out! But after he hits Tom Tucker with his car and lets it slip that he's really not allowed to say that anymore, Tom lets it slide because it was only an accident. Only Peter misconstrues this and thinks he can get away with anything if he simply says he can't really say that word anymore. I mean, I guess he could. He does have privileges, but I don't, and YouTube also doesn't. Ah! Jeez, didn't you hear me a second ago? I'm... <laughs> Oh, you're just curious. Well, let me show you how everything works down there. All seems well until an accident happens at a restaurant that gets Lois covered in burns and the children taken away by CPS. Hey, I'm Agent Jessup from Child Services. I'm here to take your kids away. What? Why? Because you're mentally unfit to take care of them. No way! Oh my God. Finally! Now, how does this relate to the rest of the show? And why do I consider it number one? Because it could explain a good chunk of this list. Remember Pretoria? Peter Peter will do anything if he thinks there's no consequences. And he's somebody who doesn't learn his lesson very easily. Or he could, but then he gets the wrong takeaway. Or the next episode comes and he resets. So I could totally buy this being the moment where his flanderization kicked in. Think of it this way. Peter gets diagnosed, and he starts to use his scientifically approved idiocy as a way to do whatever he wants, especially towards his family. He becomes crazy and a jerk because now he can. And this causes them to follow suit and all devolve. Lois can't or won't leave him, so she suffers in a failing marriage and resents her children for something they have no control over. Chris has no role models, so he turns into a destructive idiot not unlike his father. Meg's abuse gets worse because everybody treats her as a stress ball, hence her becoming so depressed. Stewie starts to latch onto Brian as a father figure, as his real one doesn't want to be bothered with him. But while I do think Stewie is gay, or at least something, he's still a baby and he's young, and he has no idea that the feelings he has for Brian are probably paternal, hence his secret crush on him. Brian has fewer prospects, so he starts a writing career, even if he's not good at it, as it's the only way he will ever get out of the house and make something of himself. Peter makes fun of Joe for being in a wheelchair, which leads to him getting flanderized. Said toxicity rubs off on Bonnie, hence her suddenly resenting Joe. In Quagmire, yeah, I can't explain him. Maybe he just had like a midlife crisis. 